Please welcome Sherry Redstone. Hey, Sherry. Good over there. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. You had a good perspective on the, the Martian there. I did indeed. You know exactly why there was a, a Chinese plot in that, in that movie. I do. You want to spell it out for anyone who doesn't know here, since you're in the movie business? Well, since I'm in the movie business, and since this is all very highly confidential, I think sometimes in the movie industry, we like to have some connection to China to make sure that our films actually have an ability to play in China. And I think so. Um, and I'm sure it was definitely because the Chinese had the best system to get up in space and save America once again. She said it, it is true. Um, I think you, most of you know about Sherry's involvement with CBS and Viacom. We're gonna talk about that. Some of you may not know what you do at Advance It. Oh. Let's talk about that for starters. What is Advance It? Advance It Capital is a company that I actually started back in 2011. And I was actually sitting in a Viacom board meeting and we were talking about Jersey Shore. And we were thinking about- Back when Jersey Shore was the thing. Jersey Shore was the thing. And they were looking at putting different franchises in different countries and looking at merchandising. And I remember asking, do we know who's watching the show? And the answer was no. And I started asking a lot of questions and I realized that there were a lot of changes taking place in technology that I thought were really gonna have an impact on our industry. So a couple of years later, I started Advanced Capital with my son-in-law. And what we really tried to do was take a look at what were the challenges that were taking place in the media and entertainment industry and what were gonna be the opportunities going forward. So back in 2011, you had all the traditional media companies here. You had the new technology companies here. Traditional media companies thought that these guys were gonna disappear. These guys thought that they were gonna succeed without traditional media companies. And what I found really exciting is how was all of this gonna to come together to create the future of media and entertainment. So it's not uncommon for big media conglomerates, Comcast does it, Time Warner does it, to have a venture arm and they go make bets on these kind of companies. You usually don't see people who are controlling shareholders, people who are running these media conglomerates also doing venture investing, because to be clear, that's what you're doing. You're doing right. early stage and venture investing in companies like? Companies like Moat, which was just bought by Oracle, which was one of our first investments that had to do with ad tech and really creating a better platform for advertising, like Maker Studios, which was acquired by Disney. We're now investing in virtual reality, artificial intelligence, new content creation platforms. So why not have Viacom Ventures? Why not have CBS Ventures do that? Why are you doing it yourself? Well, first of all, I would say a lot of Comcast Ventures and these new companies actually started in the last few years. And I was looking at this many, many years ago. But when I take a look at my roles at Viacom and at CBS, I think the most value that I can add to them is really understanding what's going on in this world. What is the future? Where is the consumer going? What are the trends that we're seeing that impact consumer behavior, that impact our businesses? So I think Viacom and CBS do look at these companies at a later stage. I get an earlier look at these companies and an earlier look and thought process around how do we need to be thinking about our business. And how hands-on are you in terms of sourcing this stuff, meeting with the entrepreneurs? There's a lot of people who do what you do in this room. Are you doing the exact same thing they're doing or is it a different version of it? Nobody does the exact same thing, but I'm very hands-on. I love sitting with entrepreneurs on a regular basis, hearing about how they think about the world, how they think their technology is gonna be relevant to some of the things that we're doing. I mean, one of the themes that I see today is that consumers you know, not only want to consume their content wherever they want it, on whatever platform they want, they want a more interactive, engaging experience with content. You know, how do I think about this? We invested in a company called Outpost. You know, we've done a lot of investments in the esports area. Outpost is a company that is looking at making the players in esports become performers and the spectators become an audience. So not only can you weigh in on the performance of the player, you can actually impact the game. You know, we look at a company we invested in called Outline, and I think Josh is actually here, which is looking at how do you create the news? How do you look at the digital platform as giving you the opportunities to, what's, what's the right format for a story? What's the right way to integrate your advertising and to make it relevant to the consumer and to increase engagement? So when I see that in the companies we're looking at, it helps me bring, I think, a different perspective and, to Viacom and, and what CBS. do you use for like a reality check or a translator? You mentioned Moat, I think Jonah Goodhart's somewhere here. And I think that's pivoted a few times since it exited. 
or it's not officially exited, but you can still applaud. Um, but it's ad tech, right? I think yep. people in ad tech yep. have a hard time understanding ad tech. When Jonah Goodhart says, here's what we're doing, who do you, do you rely on someone to translate that for you into English? Well, I, I don't understand the technology behind it, but I think I do understand what people are trying to achieve. So it is very important to us to meet with the founders, to understand what their vision is, what problem they're trying to attack, where they want to be going forward. Every company pivots. I mean, part of what we look at when we're meeting with these founders is what's going to happen when the world changes? What's going to happen when they have a problem? Are they coachable? Are they going to be able to go in a different direction? So all of that is really important to us. And I'm very hands-on on it. We work with the companies afterwards and really try to have an impact on their businesses going forward. Is there a deal you wanted but got away and you really regret it, or a deal you didn't want and now you regret not wanting it, you can think of? Well, yes, I think our biggest mistake was Twitch. But the reason that was a mistake, because I have to defend myself just a bit, is it was our first investment in our second fund, it would have been. And we actually have a very rigid process by which we look at companies. So we really try to look for a valuation under 10. We try to look for a 10 times return. And it was a little further along than we would have wanted it but to be. But this wasn't you saying, boy, no one's ever going to want to stream video games live. Oh, my and God. Watch that. I have to tell you that 12 years ago, I had a business called Psy Games, where it was people watching other people play video games in the movie theater. And we would do these lockdowns for the weekends, and people would come in, and we'd make our money on concessions. We didn't have the prizes that they have today. But I understood this behavior years and years and years ago. Um, unfortunately, 12 years ago, it was too expensive to do in the theaters because of the hardware. Now, obviously, you can see it but online. You saw Twitch, you got it, Global. you just couldn't do the yeah. And we've invested in several companies in esports since then. And my lesson learned is that sometimes it may not exactly fit the mold, but even if you're still raising money and you have a story to tell your investors and your future investors, you can explain a good deal and a reason why if you have a good thought process behind it. And again, this is completely distinct from Viacom and CBS. There's no connections. There's no Absolutely expectation that it's none. strategic. No. No one's coming to you with a hope that they're going to end up on the Viacom platform or working for CBS. No, but I think one of the things people look at when they look at myself, my partner John Miller, you know, and Jason, is that we obviously have a background and an understanding of traditional media businesses. We obviously have a good Rolodex. So whether it's introducing them to one of my companies or to another media company, I introduce these guys to Universal, to Time Warner. You know, we want to make them successful. Obviously, we introduce them to Viacom or CBS when appropriate. But, you know, that's part of what we bring to the table, understanding what's their exit strategy, who are the companies they should be working with as they build their businesses. You've watched, you've watched big media companies do M&A both on, on the companies you work with and you've watched like what's going on with Disney and Maker. There doesn't seem to be a successful track record generally for big media companies acquiring these technology companies and doing something with them. It usually seems to end... Tears may be the wrong word because people make money, um, but it doesn't seem to work out. It doesn't seem to get integrated. It doesn't seem to be a lot of uh, benefit. How does what you're doing now is in investing impact how you're looking at Viacom and CBS in terms of their M&A? Um, I first of all agree with you that I think a lot of the companies had opportunities when they bought these companies that they did not take advantage of. But I think the world is changing very quickly. And I think whereas before, companies were dipping their toes in the water, playing with new technologies, now traditional companies have to figure out how do you integrate these core changes that are taking place in our world, these changes in technology into their business. So they're thinking about it differently, and they're wanting to play in this space differently. So I think whether it's opportunities for M&A, whether it's opportunities to work with these companies going forward, we're going to be doing a better job of it. So let's talk about CBS and Viacom. Sure. Long back and forth battle. You end up controlling these two companies um, over the last couple of years. Two, they're both obviously big media companies, very different broadcast cable networks. At one point, Viacom was going to be the, the star. And now CBS is the star. Uh, last they're fall. They're both stars. They're both your children. And I love them. Um, Last fall, you put out a press release that says, more or less, we'd like to combine the two companies. I'm reading that thinking, well, that's a done deal because you don't announce that unless you've already done the work you need to do to combine those two companies. Turned out the deal didn't happen. Why didn't it happen? Well, I think the release we put out was that we wanted independent committees formed at each company to explore whether or not it made sense. But you're the controlling shareholder of both companies. Together. 
Correct, and I think at the right time, it was an exploration that needed to take place, but by going through that process, we were able to figure out whether or not it did in fact make sense. I think looking at the changes that were taking place in the industry, the changes in distribution, to me, it made sense to figure out if you put these companies together, if you have content for all of these demographics, is that gonna be the right thing? But what happened during the process, and I should add that we told both companies go down parallel tracks. CBS obviously continued to do what they were doing and doing very well. Viacom actually had to transition and transform itself. And what I saw very quickly was the energy that existed at Viacom. I started spending a lot of time with Bob Backish, who I had known before, and talking to him about what his vision was. The guy who had been running international. He had been running international. He had been running it very successfully for many years. We talked about it. And what became apparent to me very quickly is that our assets were really undervalued, which I had understood. But what I didn't understand at the time was the significant upside that existed in our businesses once we had a good management team in place and the culture came back. The people were so energized and so motivated. So as I saw things starting to evolve at Viacom much more quickly than I ever could have imagined, when I saw the potential for strong management, when I saw people just wanting to give their hearts and souls to making this company great again, when I saw that we were continuing to do business, we made an acquisition at that time in Argentina for Telefe. We, we reorganized a company, we had a vision, we had a strategy, and to many in this room, you might think having a vision and a strategy in a public company automatically happens. Well, trust me, after many years at Viacom, having a vision and having a strategy was a new thing, and it was an exciting thing. And I think that what I felt is that if we were to do a merger at that time, the momentum that had built so quickly and so strongly would have so been So that was squashed. your call? That was you saying, actually, I don't want to do this? It was our call at National. You know, we made the decision. We saw what was taking place, and we felt that actually it would be in the best interest of both companies at that point in time to go down the track, which we had asked them to continue. Just to put a, a fine point on it, most people who follow this say, well, what happened was you wanted Les Moonves, who runs CBS, to run both companies, and for whatever reason, he didn't want to do that. And if he wanted to do that, you would have combined the two companies. I have a great relationship with Les, and I think that we could have worked really well together on a combined company. But I think, like I said, at that point in time, you know, you looked at the valuations. We were undervalued. The change for me was oh my God, there is potential here. There is opportunity here. We can do this. And it took me some time to figure out, because, you know, to be honest, you know, I wasn't the most welcome person at Viacom for the few years prior to uh, what changed? the ultimate changes. Oh, what changed is great new management and a fantastic board. And then you brought in a new board. I brought in a new board. We brought in a new board. And they were people who not only had tremendous skill sets to bring to the table, but the time and the wish to really work with me and work with management to bring Viacom back to where I know it will be and to make it even better than it was So before. let's talk a little bit more about Viacom, right? I understand the argument that says it's undervalued and it's, it's gone so far down it has to go up. Um, but we just had Jeff Bukas on. He's running one of the biggest uh, entertainment companies. He's saying it now's a good time to sell, or six months ago is a good time to sell. I'm, I'm glad I'm out. Of, he didn't say it on stage, but I'm glad I'm out of this business. Um, it seems like everyone is moving towards scale. And I think you said Viacom needs more scale. And they're moving towards, at least currently, the conventional wisdom is some combination of distribution and content. So Bob Backish can move around stuff at Viacom and he can work on distribution deals with individual cable companies, but it's still basically a handful of, of, of cable properties and a movie studio. Can you do anything transformative with those things or do you have to go buy something or sell it to something else? Okay, there are many A lot there, sorry. To what you said, what was that last one? I said I'm sorry for laying all that on you. Oh no, that's breaking fine. The chunks. But I want to go back to what you said about Jeff because I think what Jeff said, now is a great time to do this transaction. But why is now a great time? Because content is being valued more highly than it ever was before. You know, my dad once said, content is king. I think what you're seeing now is technology companies realizing they need that content. They need that original content in order to succeed and have the relationship they want with the consumer. The, the stock market, sorry to interrupt, but for the last few months has been freaking out again about cable companies saying, this is like a couple years ago, these things are going to go lower than we thought. I think that, for you know, sure, 
you know, this industry is being challenged. Pay TV industry is being challenged, but it's still a very, very big business. Even with a one to 4% decline every year, it's still gonna be a big business in a few years, but you are absolutely right. What does Viacom have to do? They have to create great content. We have great brands. People love our brands. They want to see them come back. We have to great, create great content on multiple platforms. I think one of the things that media companies can do to differentiate themselves from traditional distribution companies is we can take our content. We can put it in the real world. We can put it in the linear world. We can put it in the digital world. Number one, create great content. Build our brands back. Number two, you've heard Bob talk about a, um, a short form video content creation studio, going direct to the consumer with content. I think that's a tremendous opportunity for us. You know, the consumer has wanted their content on mobile devices for a very long time. Before you could take content, you could put it on Snapchat, put it on Instagram, make it mobile. Now you've really got to focus on creating great content on these platforms. The consumer doesn't just want mobile, they want a great viewing experience. I think bringing our content more directly to the consumer in that area is going to be a great opportunity. Are you guys going to do that yourself? Well, some of the media companies are saying, we're going to figure out how to sell this stuff directly to our consumers. Most people, though, are selling it through a cable company or maybe now they're selling it through Apple or Amazon or Netflix. I think you're going to see, you know, as on pay TV, you're going to see the entertainment bundle, which Bob is talking about, about packaging our content. This is, this is the bundle of all the cable channels except the sports guys. Well, no, it's not the bundle of all of them except the sports guys. It's a small bundle of entertainment channels that you might want with your networks. I mean, the truth is, if we were to ask everybody in this room, we all want different content. And we're all going to ultimately put together not one bundle, but probably two or three or four to get what we want. We are going to be one of those bundles as you go forward. But again, you know, that's our traditional content. I think you're going to see us creating different kinds of content in this mobile structure. And we're going to continue to look to expand and see what might make sense for us going forward. And let's talk about CBS. Mm -hmm. Last Minute is running it. You just signed him up for another two-year contract. He's going to run it forever. Um, he's fantastically successful at broadcast, um, even though it's a declining business, he seems to be doing very well at it. Um, there's a lot of discussion about sports and the value of sports and sports rights. You guys have paid a lot for the NFL. NFL ratings were down last year, the last couple of years. Are you at all worried? We just talked about the fact that Viacom doesn't have sports. Um, are you all worried that, at all worried that CBS is overexposed to sports and football? No, I think sports is really important to a lot of people. I mean, people go to CBS for news, for sports, for you know, our general entertainment content. I think it's a great vertical to be in. And I think that's going to be part of our success going forward and something that we have uniquely because you know, people want exclusive content, whether it's TV shows, whether it's sports, whether it's news. And I think that's one of the things that gives CBS that exclusive. Why, why do you think NFL ratings were down last year? Well, as a major NFL fan, I think that the NFL... You are a serious... If you can't guess from the accent, you, you have a particular team you're rooting for. There is a particular team I'm rooting for, and it is the New England Patriots, so I happen to be with the right team at the right time. But I should say I've had season tickets since 1986, so I've been through the tough years. But I, I think that the, it got very confusing for the consumer with the NFL last year. I think they were on too many networks. They started to commoditize the experience and not really keep it, you know, as something that was really special on Sundays, on Thursdays. You didn't know what network it was found on. I think they had a lot of social issues that they were dealing with, whether it was you know, the concussion issue or domestic violence, made a big mistake taking Tom Brady out of the four games at the beginning of the year. You know, yeah, there Bill were Simmons some players, you know, out there who weren't playing. And I think that, you know, for the league, that wasn't necessarily a good decision. CBS, by the way, is one of the companies pushing Thursday, right? You guys have spent I a lot of Thursday money. I think Thursday night football is good, but you have so many players in it that, you know, if you really want, for me, if I want to watch the Patriots, I will always find where they are. If it's Thursday night and there's not a particular game I'm watching, the first thing I'm going to do is say, hey, let me watch Thursday night football. But if I see something on my way to the football game, I might not watch that. So I think for, it just got too much, too many stations, too many networks. And I do believe that some of the stars weren't there in the beginning of the year. Um, but I think it's a great franchise. It's going to get stronger. I heard that the games are longer. They're taking a look at that. They're taking a look at the refereeing process. They're taking a look at some, making some more changes in the game to speed it up. I have full confidence in the NFL. They're a great organization, and 
we love our football. As someone who's investing a lot in football, what do you think about Twitter and now Amazon is playing around with football and everyone expects when these deals come up in a couple years that you will probably see Amazon, Apple, Google, Facebook all making bids for these games that you traditionally have shown. Can you compete with those guys for sports rights? It's all going to be about the experience around content. So absolutely, and by the way, we have the NFL tied up for a very long time, so I'm not... Not that long, a few years. Is right. It's pretty out there. All right. Very much out there. But I think it's not just content. It's the experience around the content. I think we have great broadcasts. I think we have great visuals. I think that's going to continue to evolve with the technologies out there. So I do believe that the experience that CBS brings is going to ma really matter. Your guys hate it that, that uh, Amazon, Twitter and then Amazon are taking your broadcasts and redistributing them and getting credit for, for broadcasting the game. But it's it's your broadcast. Well, it is our broadcast. You know, life isn't perfect. You have to make the best with what you're given. Trust me, I've learned that. Um, very upbeat. So Do we, let's ask if we have questions. Otherwise, I have other ones for Miss Redstone. It's quiet, eager. No, they're very modest here. They're all ah. questioned out. Huh? Huh? <laughs> Hope Tammy's asking a question, not walking out. Here she is. Hi, um, Sharon, I have a question about NFL and the live sporting events. Do you see an interactive component that the networks will embrace to bring kids in or keep them there longer? No, I think that it is going to be more interactive. You're going to, whether you're doing it on one device or you're doing it on multiple devices, people are going to do that. But, you know, you heard Steve say yesterday, too, you know, there's something great about going to football. You want to wait until you don't lose what it's all about, which is watching the game. So right now, I think it's a little complicated with the technology that's out there to bring all of it into the viewing experience. But I do believe that will evolve with time, as will the viewing of other content, not just sports. Do you think VR is, is a good match for sports? I'm not sure I would want to watch an entire game in virtual reality, but I think there are pieces of it that might be really exciting to see. I have to admit, we invested in a company called Striver, which does human performance training for athletes, and they're now actually maybe going to be working with some of the leagues to train referees, because one of the things you find it really hard to do is get the repetitions that you need and the experience you need. And for referees, for example, in football, when do they follow the player? When do they stay still? Just think if they're in a virtual reality world and they have an opportunity to experience that over and over again so that when they get in the live game, they know how to you know, how to react. So that's almost so, industrial use, right? So I think there's an industrial use. I think for the viewer, I, I still think that watching a game in virtual reality is not where it's at. You might want to experience, you know, a moment of Tom Brady in the huddle and how does he see the world. Look at, you know, at Biocom, we're looking at Bellator and we're using some virtual reality experience as to how the fighter gets on, what he's looking at, it, what is the game from his perspective. So I think there are limited uses for it, but I don't think it's headed Do you towards think that's because... The, it's the act of putting on the goggles and that separates you from whoever you're watching with or do you think you, because actually watching on TV with multiple angles is the best way to watch something? I think both. Okay. I think Good. both. No other questions for Sherry? You were worried about this interview. I How don't worry now? about the interview. I was just worried about you. I think I did okay. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate My it. My pleasure. Thanks, Sherry.